Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the boardroom, our special, our super special on Tigris and Euphrates with uh, Reiner Knizia on the phone with us. Uh, hi, Reiner, welcome back. Hello. Uh, we're going to be talking about scoring now, and when I teach this game, I changed my method. Instead of just going through the rules normally, I start with the scoring because I think if people understand the scoring of this game, everything falls into place. Why don't you take us through the, the starting steps of that? Yes. I mean, as we already discussed in the episode one, uh, scoring in this game is very, very tricky because essentially you are scoring in four different dimensions which are in the game. That is religion, that is the, the people and the king, and then you have the farming and the, and the uh, trading as well. And, of course, uh, the scoring will come out of your weakest area, and, of course, that makes it very tricky because you can't just try to concentrate on your successes. You always have to <laughs> concentrate on your weaknesses and try to bring them up as possible. I personally think that a scoring mechanism is actually the heart of the game, because... When you play a game, you want to win the game. It's not important that you win the game because I think a good game also provides a lot of fun and enjoyment for the loser. That's actually one of my definitions of a good game. In a good game, the losers also win, in inverted commas, because they have a lot of fun. Uh, so you, but, but the objective still is you want to win. You want to have an objective in the game. And the objective is really driven by the score. Because in, in, in whatever way you make points and you will be the winner, that is what guides you through the game. And I, I give you an example of a game everybody knows, that is chess. We know that in chess, in chess, the objective is to checkmate the king, to beat the king. Now, you could also define that you say you need to capture all the uh, opponent's pieces. Or you could say you need to bring one of your pawns through to the baseline of the other player. This would make, and, and keep all the other rules the same, this would make a very, very different game. And that's the same for, for all the, the uh, games which we commercially have on the, on the market now. If you have a very interesting scoring mechanics, then you get a very interesting and a very innovative game. What I like to do, and that's always one of my starting points, I like to think about the scoring right from the beginning and say, how can I actually manage that the players get a lot of excitement out of the scoring and uh, there are very, very many different ways to do it. And I think whenever I have a new way of scoring, then I have almost got a new game. <laughs> and if I may, I'll give you some examples. The, we have recently talked in one of the episodes about Through the Desert. Oh, I love that game. Yeah. And uh, Through the Desert is constructed very differently because in Through the Desert you have many different ways to score. You score for the longest caravans, you score for certain territories you enclose, uh, you score for linking to water holes or to oases. So that means, again, you have a multitude of different objectives, and that essentially then creates the character of the game, that there are so many things to do, and you have only got two things to do on each turn, and you want to do so many more, so you have a rich choice, and that's what I expect from a game. If you look at something else, for example, Samurai, uh, which has also been published in the States, and as far as I know, you have also done an episode about this, uh, we're uh, going to be doing one soon. Okay. Then in Samurai, you have three dimensions where you need to be successful, but you need to be the master in one of those dimensions. That means you need to be better than everybody else in this one dimension. And once you have achieved this, then you get measured according to how well you are doing in the other two dimensions. Okay. And that, for example, creates a very nice dilemma because if you don't put enough energy into mastering one of these elements, then you're not even qualifying for winning the game. However, if you put too much effort into this mastering, then you're neglecting the other two areas, <laughs> and then you will be measured according to how much you achieve in the other areas, then you qualify for winning, but you can't win because you're too weak in the actual score. And there are lots of ways to go into a game, and whenever you have a very new way of scoring, to guiding people, to challenge people, I think then you find something new and that was one of the, the starting points of scoring mechanics in Tigers and Euphrates, to come back to our theme now. At the very beginning, at the core of the development, was this idea that you need to balance civilization, you need to find the harmony, and therefore uh, I will actually 
put the players under pressure as a designer and say, whatever you do, you will always be good in some areas and you will always have some problems in other areas and I want you to, to then suffer from these problems in inverted commas and make sure uh, that you get out of this problem and that's where your challenge comes in and that's where your success is measured from. Well, the, the beauty of this game is exactly the way you just described it. And it's interesting to hear you talk about that, but it's the balance in this game. And it doesn't matter if you have 22, 30 points in one color. For instance, exactly. the church, if you've only got five in your worst one, you have not won the game. You have not done what's required. Uh, remarkable scoring. And again, that's the reason I always start explaining that. Uh, once they explain, understand that, they know this game is a game of balance. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, let's let's run now to uh, how you use leaders and maybe some other specific areas yes. on how you exactly and precisely do score points. Yes, uh, leaders are important because leaders are the core of the players' roles. They represent a dynasty and they place the leaders on the board and therefore build the kingdoms and try to make the kingdoms prosper. If you do not have a leader on the board, you cannot score. You can only score through leaders. On your turn, you have two activities, and an activity is either placing a tile or placing a leader. There are some minor other alternatives, but that's the, the core of the game. If you place a leader, you will not be able to score through that activity. But without having a leader on the board, you cannot score. So you need to use some of your activities to bring the leaders into the game. The actual scoring is always triggered by placing a tile. And there are very two very simple mechanics how you score by placing a tile. If you place a tile in a kingdom and the related king or the related leader is in that kingdom, then this leader will score one point. So as a specific example, if you place a green tile into any of the kingdoms and there is a green leader, this green leader will pick a victory point. It doesn't matter if that is your leader or anybody else's leader. Of course you want to play those tiles into the, in the kingdoms so that you get these points. Very straightforward, simply place it in there, pick up these points. This is something which happens from turn to turn. What I have built in and which is already a little bit a higher strategy is you can build monuments in, in the game. And maybe we want to show that just as a little example on the board. If you look at the board, there is in the lower left-hand corner, there is a kingdom. Yes, we have that right on the screen there. Which is stretched out, and it has three leaders in there. There is the priest, who is coming from the archer. And then there is the king, the black one. The priest is the red one. The, the black one comes from the potter, and that is the king. And finally, the merchant is shown in green, and the merchant, again, uh, belongs to the archer. Now, when you look at this, there are three tiles, which are people tiles, the black ones, which are part of a larger square. And now, if we put another tile into the remaining empty space of that two-by-two two square, then we have created a structure which is strong enough carry a monument. So if we do that, then you see this square, and when we, as the player who played the last final tile into this, when we decide we want to build a monument right away now, then we turn all four of these tiles over and place a monument there. We are done with that. Now, which monument do you, how do you decide what monument you want to play? Yes. Monuments and that's one of the tricks of the game again, are, are having two colors. So you have to choose a monument with the black color because that's where the, the base structure originated from. But now you have the free choice if you want to put uh, with it the green color, the red color, or uh, the blue color. In this case, let's assume that if the, if the black player, uh, if, if, the, if the potter played the tile because he's the black player, then he will try, of course, to get the black color in there, which he has to do, but then he will not want to give points to the other players. So what he will probably do is he will choose the black-blue combination because that ensures that the scoring which originates continuously from these monuments will not be to the benefit of the other player, which is the archer. 
And of course, this is actually a masterpiece of a, of a turn because once he put the blue-black monument on this spot, he has so far only used one of his activities. So of course, what he immediately will do is, in the second turn, uh, he could then place his blue potter into the kingdom and thereby also occupy the other leadership role in the kingdom which will benefit from the monument. Exactly. How do you benefit from the monument? Very simple. At the end of your turn, you look at the kingdoms, and if the leaders are in kingdoms which have monuments of the respective color, you simply score for them. So in this case, having built the monument and having finished your turn, you would then see that the potter has a black leader with the black colored monument, and he also has, if he moved over the blue leader, with the blue colored monument, so he would pick up a black victory point and a blue victory point. And he would do that every turn. So while the placement of an individual tile gives the respective leader one victory point once, being together in a, in a kingdom with a monument gives you a continuous income and a continuous benefit as long as you represent the, the related leader in that kingdom. Elegant, uh, purely elegant. I, I just love the way the colors match up and, and the strategy you need to, to pick the right monument and to set this all up properly. It's just, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, okay, we, we've covered that. We've covered the monuments uh, and the leaders. I think that just about covers what we wanted to talk about primarily on this segment. We're going to come back with a second a segment on scoring, and we're going to talk a lot about conflicts, both internal and external in the second part here. So thanks for watching uh, this first part of the scoring analysis with Reiner Knizia. Uh, we'll be right back soon with a new show. Take care, everyone.